All right, uh, welcome everyone to the first event of the fall 2020 semester sponsored by the Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies. My name is Stephen Norris. I'm a professor of history at Miami and I'm also the director of the Havinghurst Center. And the Havinghurst Center uh, sponsors a number of initiatives, among them a Lithuanian program, which is headed up by my colleague, Associate Professor of Anthropology, Neringa Klumbite, who's also joining us. And this event today is part of the Lithuanian program. Um, and it's timed particularly well because yesterday marked the anniversary of the Baltic chain from 1989. There was a kind of recreation of one um, because of events in Belarus. And it also yesterday was a day set aside as a, to remember victims of Nazism and communism in the Baltic republics. So it's appropriate that we're joined today by Yulia Shukis, who is a writer of creative nonfiction and associate professor of creative writing at the University of Missouri. She's the author most recently of Siberian Exile, Blood, War, and A Granddaughter's Reckoning, which won the 2018 Vine Award for nonfiction and the 2018 AABS Book Prize. She's also the author of Epistophilia, Writing the Life of Ona Shimate, winner of the 2013 Helen and Stan Vine Canadian Jewish Book Award for Holocaust Literature, and the author of Silence is Death, The Life and Work of Tahar Jayut. Shukis is also the director of the Missouri Audio Project and a senior editor at ASE, a journal of nonfiction studies. Today's conversation will focus on her most recent book, Siberian Exile. Um, it's a story of her grandparents, Ona and Anthony. The former, Ona, told family stories in Lithuania of her experiences being deported during the Stalinist deportations in June 1941, while the latter, Anthony, was mostly silent as, as Yulia grew up. In researching and writing their stories, which are quintessential stories of the 20th century Baltic lands, uh, Shukis discovered some shocking truths about her grandfather. So we'll, we'll start with there. Um, the book opens, the first chapter, in fact, consists of just three short sentences. Someone always pays. The question is who, and the question is how. So tell us about this first chapter, about how these sentences capture 20th century Lithuania and 20th century Lithuanian dilemmas. Yeah, so you can see that's the first chapter. Um, I like I like white space a lot. Actually, I like I'm a, I'm a writer um, who I think a lot about brevity, and this is a very short book. Um, and the first chapter is sort of emblematic of of my method of writing. But what does it say about um, 20th century Lithuania? Um, in a sense, that that first chapter was a way of um, responding to the question that I was, that, or the, uh, the sort of reaction that people gave me as I was starting to tell people, as I began to tell people um, what I had discovered about my grandfather. And that was, well, what does this have to do with you, right? You don't have anything to do with that. You don't carry any complicity um, in his crimes, his sins are not your sins. And so the question sort of the question of the book is, well, what is it? What does it mean for me? Um, what is what is my role as as an inheritor um, in this story? Um, and the question for me really was like the question was really who pays and how? Um, and the question was, have I paid? What how do I pay? Um, did my father pay? And I think he did. Um, how did my aunts pay? And part of the book, the book is dedicated to my son. Um, and, you know, I, I, I dedicated the book for him and I wrote this book in large part. So, and I, I've said this in, in other contexts as well. And I, I wrote, I wrote the book in part so that he wouldn't have to, I, I did this work so that he wouldn't have to so that I could, so that somebody could, so that the payment could, that I could try, I don't know if it's possible <laughs> to stop that chain of payment, um, but that's sort of the hope that there's a kind of freedom that comes from this kind of work. Um, so yeah, so it's an answer to that question of like, well, what is this, what does this have to do with you? And, and the book is the answer to that question. I mean, so this is a way of sort of opening the book and sort of saying, okay, here's what we're thinking about. Here's what we're talking about. We're talking about, we're talking about this question of, 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 of what does it have to do with now? And what does it have to do with me? It's, it's interesting. That's fascinating too, to think about the way trauma can or cannot be passed on for generations. 
Um, and at the heart of the first part of the book is your, is your grandfather's story, who you alluded to. And it's interesting you use the term freedom in your answer. Your son has the freedom not to research it because his story gets us to the heart of one story of Lithuanian history in the 20th century, that of freedom fights, the term he uses, um, but also one used widely in Lithuania. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about your grandfather, this concept and the dangers in using it and the way that his silences kind of cast a shadow over um, the way you grew up? That, that is, he, he, you didn't know the story much until you started this book. So tell us a little bit more about your grandfather and what you discovered and what his story well, illustrates. So when you, when you use the term freedom fights with real, in relation to Anthony, do you mean the wartime or do you mean, do you mean World War I freedom? Yeah freedom battles or the world or the later ones? Or I guess that's the question. Sure, I'm thinking, I guess, you know, the, the, the museum in Vilnius that used to be called the Museum of Genocide Victims is now called the okay. Museum of Genocide and Freedom Fights or something like that. So freedom, right. this concept of freedom and freedom fighting is packaged into. Yeah, um, and the Forest Brothers and all of that. Exactly. Um, so, well, so the, the, the freedom wars that I refer to in the book um, are, in our, our the fight for independence, right? Or, or the, it's he, my grandfather was really um, specific about and framed it as a as his his role in the nascent Lithuanian army, um, as a fight against the Bolsheviks, and uh, and then he he was part of the very first army of Lithuania and was a decorated war hero, and he got you know he was decorated at like age twenty, so that really sort of set him up as this um, that was his great honor. Right, and that was the story we were told about him. And then, of course, in Lithuania, we have this this succession of, of occupations, and things start to get really messy because the 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 story that we're told as kids growing up um, in exile, and kids growing up in the Soviet Union, of course, were told a similar black and white story. It just had different dearest different heroes and villains in it. You know, our heroes and villains. Um, the Germans were rarely part of that story. We have the first occupation of the Bolsheviks coming in in 1940, and then and and then we have the Germans who stay until 1944, and then the Soviets who return in 1944. So my the 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 period, and then the period of the of the Forest Brothers is is after that is in like the 50s, and there were guerrilla wars that were happening. Um, in the forest, there were also guerrilla wars all through the German occupation. There was like the there were, there were Polish factions and there were Jewish factions and there were Lithuanian factions in the forest and all sort of fighting each other. So I think what I think the danger is a kind of flattening and a kind of um, simplification and a kind of um, erasure of of complexity um, in the history. And you know, Lithuania is a place. One of the things that happens when you start working. Um, when you start sort of looking outside of the Lithuanian narrative, the Lithuanian ethnic narrative about this country in any way, is you start to see the ways in which the country is contested and layered. And you can see that linguistically. Every town and every village has three or four different names, right? That has, it has a Yiddish name, it has a Polish name, it has, sometimes it has a German name and it has a Lithuanian name, sometimes it has a Russian name. So I say this, I, I explored this with, with Newtown, which I call Newtown, right? So I rebaptize and I give it an English name. Um, and we can, you know, if you're interested, we can talk about why I did that. Um, but this kind of layering and this kind of, this, you know, who do these cities belong to? Um, I was just talking to somebody, I'm reading a, a, a Lithuanian dissertation, well, she's, it's, a, it's a, a dissertation about Lithuania being written at the University of Vilnius, but in English. Um, and in this dissertation, I came across a sentence that said, um, that claimed that Vilnius used to be called Vilna in, in Yiddish. And I, and I stopped and I said, it's still called Vilna in Yiddish. Like, it doesn't stop being called Vilna just because there's a there's a regime change or there's a there's a there's a movement of populations. So I think really that that some of some of the you know some of the lessons that we especially today in America can take from you know looking at that kind of history is a is is learning to embrace complexity and learning to sort of understand that that there's that there are many 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 histories and many many versions um, and many many claims to a space you know and that and that they're not necessarily they're not mutually exclusive like a city can be both polish and jewish and lithuanian and german you know so i think that that's that that's the danger that i see as a kind of simplification that ends that 
that then ends in bloodshed and hatred in the worst case scenario. Related. That's really well said, by the way. I, I tell my students all the time to embrace nuance, embrace complexity. And of course, the history of Lithuania is in that short overview is so complex. Um, and, it, and, you know, central to your grandfather's story is that, as you said, he, he can lay claim to being a freedom fighter. He did fight for Lithuania's independence. He was Absolutely. under medals for it. At the same time, one of the, you know, the most shocking discovery you make, I think, in the book is that your grandfather most likely participated in the murder of some of his Jewish neighbors during the Holocaust when when Lithuania was occupied by German forces. So, so tell us about the, that discovery. You, you went and used KGB archives, you found records that your father is named in, and this is the story then that is part of this larger complex story. And, and, and in a way, um, his, his being able to lay claim to being a freedom fighter is a way of not think, thinking too deeply about his other role as perhaps a complicit in murder. And of allowing, I mean, what one of the things that sort of became really clear to me was that his his sort of place in the family was very much defined by this moment in his very early adulthood, right? And like when he was 19 and 20. Um, and then so much of what had followed had essentially been erased from our family history. Um, so yeah, so I'll tell you about, about how I about how I how, how I made the discovery. Um, so I'm an archival researcher, that's what I do. Um, I love archives. I'm passionate about archives. I've worked with archives. Sorry, I've got email coming in. I thought I had closed my, my, my mail. Um, I thought um, I love archives and, and I, and so my, my sort of first instinct is always to go to the archive. Like if I want, if I'm curious about something, that's my first, that's my first go-to. Um, I had been working on Ona's story for some time and I really thought I had sort of, I had a first draft of the book. Um, I, I did, I had a first draft of the book. Um, the problem was that I wasn't finding the sort of traction that I really needed. I wasn't finding sort of the soul. I couldn't figure out what it was really about. It felt too much like a hagiography, you know, it felt too sort of, there wasn't, there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't enough darkness <laughs> in the book. So, uh, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. Um, and I had a conversation, I tell this story in the book, I had a conversation with a writer and she suggested, and, and she, she was like, you, you know, we talked about whether or not I had actually tried to get archival materials um, about my family, which I had, um, but early days, in early, early days when they weren't, um, when it, it, it access was much more difficult and things keep changing in terms of access to the, to the, to the uh, formerly KGB archives. In any case, I ended up writing to the archive and I got 400 pages of text. Um, and about 100 of those pages were about Anthony. Um, and the, it knocked the breath out of me um, and it silenced me for a year. Um, I felt um, such deep shame. I'm someone who has worked on the Lithuanian, on the Holocaust in Lithuania and on the Lithuanian Jewish community as a scholar for you know, by that point, it had been at least 15 years, right? I'd written a dissertation and a book already about these things. I'd sat with um, those ghosts for a really long time, and it felt, it felt like a cruel joke to me that that this was my discovery that I had that that now I was sort of given this task that just felt impossible. Um, and so I had to really, it took me a year before I could begin telling um, close friends and colleagues what I had discovered. I told a few very close people and then I sat with it for a year sort of in silence um, before I could really start to do something that felt like it made sense. And before I could bring myself to actually say what I had found. So it was, it was profoundly, um, it was profoundly troubling to me, like profoundly, like in ways that are, that are, it's, I, it's almost hard to remember, I've come so far that it's hard, it's hard to, to remember myself back then. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or if you does. And, and you know, I can only imagine, I mean, I, my, my grandfather fought in the American army in World War II, and I was always promised growing up by my grandmother, he died when he was only 57 and I was, I was only seven years old, um, that I would have his, his photographs and his diary from the war. Every American soldier had a diary and I was told there's this great diary of her grandfather. And then when I got it after my grandfather's death, he had ripped out every diary page. So there was nothing, wow. nothing in it. So there's, there's, a, there's a silence there, a profound silence. Yeah. I, I don't think I will ever discover that my grandfather 
I mean, I, I, it's possible he did something terrible in the war, very likely, but not to the extent that your grandfather. And, and my follow-up question, by the way, related to grandfathers is, is something that one of the students who's in attendance sent me a question to ask. And that is at times in the book, and just now even you you fell into this, you you call him Anthony sometimes and you call him grandfather other times. So is that is there a, a strategy to using those terms? And if so, why? So it's actually more complicated than that. <laughs> um, my grandfather's name in Lithuanian, of course, is Antanas. Um, and I made a really conscious decision. Um, I, I, it's, it was, it's Ona and Antanas. So I left Ona as Ona in part, um, in part simply, it's a simple name to say. I mean, Antanas isn't that hard to say. But for me, um, changing his name, anglicizing his name, I think allowed me a sort of um, break. Like it, it allowed me a little bit of um, a little bit of distance, like the bit of distance that I needed to to see him more clearly. Um, I don't know that I have much to say. I never call him grandfather. Like I never call him in the book. I always use the my grandfather. It's always in relation to me. And that may be a consequence of another choice that I made in the book. Um, I didn't, you may or may not have noticed, but they're the only people, the only family members I name in the book are, um, well, myself, obviously. I name my, um, I name Antanas, I name Anthony, Ona, and I name my cousin Darius, or Darius, as I call him. Um, everyone else is only referred to in, relate, in their relationship to me. So it's my grand, like, I, I'll, I'll say, that's why I say my, my grandfather, my grandmother a lot. But I say my father, I never name him in the book. I never name my aunts in the book. I never name my cousins beyond Darius. Darius had, I remember calling Darius and I told him about this decision that I had made um, about not naming extended family members. And I said, you know, partly that decision was, the, the decision in part was, was for me was an ethical question. And it was a question about, um, they had not, chosen to be part of this story. I didn't consult them when I wrote this book. I told them sort of after the fact and I explained and I wrote, you know, a long sort of letter saying, here's what I found. Here's what, you know, here's what I'm doing. If you have questions, um, I'm happy. I'm here. We can talk. Um, my cousin Dodges was my biggest champion and he insisted that I name him. He said, you must name me. <laughs> um, and he's like my right hand man in the book. Um, so that, so it may be that there, it's a consequence of that, right? So it's always like, I sort of would talk about the book. I would say, this is a story between me, Anthony and Olna. Like it doesn't have to do, this is not about my father. This is not about my aunts. This is not their story. And it's not their, um, reckoning. It's my reckoning. And I'm reckoning with these two. This is between us. So maybe that's part of it. Um, toggling back between Anthony and my grandfather, I think there is not such a complicated question. I don't ever like refer, like I called my, I called him Tetukas is what I called him in Lithuanian. I never use that word in the book. So there were like the, the decisions about how, how, I, how I referred to family members um, were very, very conscious. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. And it, I think in a way, it, it, I hadn't really thought about the fact you don't name other people very much. So it, it really allows you to hone in more on on the central story, this dichotomy between your grandfather and your grandmother, and the, yeah. and the way that their stories give us an entryway into these larger histories. So we, you know, we we've, we've so far talked mostly about Anthony, your grand your grandfather, but let's shift now and talk a little bit more about your grandmother, Ona, who you, as you said, you've written about before, um, and her story gets us to a second big story of Lithuanian history in the mid twentieth century, and that is of the deportations, the Stalinist deportations. So. Um, I guess I'm curious, you, you make a statement when you talk about the two of them, how in, there's a moment in 1941 when the two made a colossal and tragic misunderstanding. That is, there's a choice made between your grandmother and your grandfather about what to do that informs the rest of the story and then will later inform the silences that govern these family stories. So tell us what, what this colossal and tragic misunderstanding was and why it's so significant in your book. So the story I had always been told, so about the deportation, um, was that uh, it was a time of unrest in Lithuania and my grandfather had like lost his job and I didn't really understand why. And um, he had, he was, he was, they were moving from one city to another and it was never really clear to me as a kid what city and what city were involved. 
Um, and so he was away and she was alone at home and the kids were at the farm and she, she was home by accident. Like it, it was just that she was home, the soldiers came and they took her alone. Um, and it, like, I just had grown up with this story. I knew this was gonna happen. I knew this was gonna happen. Anyway, I'm just gonna ignore it. Um, so I grew up with this story. Hang on, I'm just gonna. Sorry about that. Oh no. Ben's taking care of it. Nice. <laughs> no, no, right. Ay ay ay. So uh, where were we? Remind me what I was talking about. Oh yes. Yeah, so the quite the, the the story of of the of the deportation. So I had grown up with this story, um, and I had sort of accepted it as as sort of unfiltered, uncritically. Um, and then I was, when I was in Lithuania doing research, it occurred to, it, it, it was when I was talking to a family member um, that she said, no, no, like your grandmother, they, they, he, they put her in that apartment alone on purpose. She was, she was left at home to protect the property and the children were sent away for safety. They were in a demilitarized zone where adults couldn't, um, couldn't travel without papers, without, uh, without military documents. And, and they just didn't believe they would take a woman alone. And so that sort of changed everything for me too. Like that for me was just like another blow. Like I just thought, how is this possible? That, um, you know, that she ended up in that situation. So that really changed things for me. So that idea that the whole thing you know, it was also this notion of like, I had, I had questions, I sort of had a lot of what if questions along the way, and that was one of them. Like, what if she had gone into hiding as well? What if she had simply somehow, you know, gone to the farm as well with the kids? What if, and then there's a question that I pose later, which is a much darker question, which is what, is, what, what, if, um, what if Anthony had been deported? Um, uh, what if he had been arrested instead of escaping? Um, and what would that alternate history have looked like? And it's, it's possible this decision, this tragic mi misunderstanding was made to cover up his actions. Is that correct? His prior actions? That is his participation in, in the Holocaust. Well, I mean, the, the, well, the, the deportation happened before the participation in the Holocaust, right? Oh, yeah, that's true, sorry. So it happened before. And so the question about, well, what would have happened had he been, had he been arrested? What the, the question, what the question is asking is like, he would have never um, worked as the chief of police under the Nazis, right? So we're talking about 1941, right? Is that right, Nettinga? I'm like, my, my date, I'm always like, is it 1940, is it 1941? Um, so yeah, so that would have been spring of 1941. And then it was fall in 1941 that he accepted the position of police chief. So in a matter of months, um, his, his life had, like he, he'd, he'd stepped over a line that he could never step back from again. So that was, so, the, so in that moment, like you sort of see the, the ways in which, um, in which our fates, you know, we come to these, and I don't think we know, we don't know that, 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 that we're living these moments. I don't think, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, we, maybe some people have that sense. I don't know that they had the sense that they were um, faced with this kind of um, enormous choice in their lives. But looking back, we see that, we see these moments that define um, human fates and, and, and futures, right? And like, and this is what I say in the book too, that that, that, that moment and those choices that they made in that spring and that fall um, ended up changing the course of our family's life for three generations. And you're right, it can turn on something so small or, or a decision like that made for, for one reason. Yeah, and you sort of think like, what was she there? Like I saw the apartment they lived in and, and I don't, like what could she possibly have been protecting? Mm -hmm. So you did, you know, one of the most moving parts of the book, there's a lot of moving parts of the book, 
Um, but one that really struck me was you, the way you recount your own visit to Ona's site of exile in Siberia. So I'm curious what you discovered there and how, how that trip helped you reimagine her experiences and, and maybe with, with them, the experiences of so many other Lithuanians exiled. And you're right, I, I think the, the, the line I, that struck me was that you had read her letters from Siberia, now you visited Siberia, her, her place of exile, and that visit both delighted and discouraged me. So how was that so? It was most, well, her letters delighted and discouraged me. Her letters really delighted and discouraged me because the letters um, sort of silenced so much. I mean, there was so much that she didn't write about. So she, and she wrote about very small things, right, in her letters. Her letters are about her cow and her pigs and the garden and the weather and the parties at the kolkhoz and all that kind of stuff. Um, Siberia was absolutely transformative. I mean, in, in as devastating and as, um, you know, as transformative as the, the, the KGB documents were in terms of like a kind of like trial by fire sort of moment, um, Siberia was the opposite. I mean, Siberia, for me was, it was totally life-changing. I, I felt, um, I really didn't expect to find anything when I went. So that was part of it. I went with very low expectations. Um, I had a couple of contacts that I had made and those contacts ended up being incredibly magical and the ways in which we ended up connecting were really magical. Um, I felt extremely welcome. I felt like there were, I met people who, who, like I could feel her presence there. People remembered her. I saw pictures of her hanging on people's walls. Um, and I found a sort of dignity to her story in that visit that I don't think I had found before then. I saw how she was remembered with such affection and respect. Um, and that was, that was really moving to me. It was so moving. I also just found people sort of living in this way, like out of time, you know, I found Moscow is so, um, I really, I really hated Moscow that summer. Moscow was, was burnt, like Russia was burning that summer. It was the summer when the bogs were burning and, you know, it, Moscow was, was filled with smoke and, and it's just such an oppressive city. And I felt, I, I feel Moscow really alienates me. Um, and so I was completely surprised when we crossed the Urals and I could breathe and, um, and seeing like the, the faces of the, the descendants of all these exiles, right? You walk around Tomsk and it's, and it's like, it's, you see the, the traces of, of Stalinism, which on the one hand, yeah, is tragic, but it's sort of, there was such beauty there also in some way. There were, the, the, the architecture was beautiful and the memory and the ways in which, you know, people were so, um, were so sort of curious about me, about who I was and why I'd come. And um, yeah, it was just this really beautiful encounter. I, it was just deeply profound and, and, and I kind of fell in love with it. Like I left Siberia kind of wanting to go back. There were regions now that I would, I would absolutely go back to just to see the land. You know, part of it, part of my process too is I just want to, I want to see the land. I want to see the sky. And I really believed that that was all I would find. I, you know, I really, a lot of people were very negative about my going to Siberia. They, they thought I was kind of nuts to want to do this. Um, I was in Siberia last summer in Tumen and, and Tambolsk, and I agree. And, you, and you've really spoken well about how, you know, in, in Russian popular consciousness, that Siberia sometimes functions as both obviously the place of exile and punishment, but a place of relative freedom because you're so far yeah. from Moscow. Yeah. And you've given us a really wonderful validation of the role of archival research, but also the role of traveling to a place because you really do get a sense of that place and how that informs your writing. Well, and talking to people. Like I believe so deeply in sort of sitting down with really, really old people and just listening to them. So the, the, the last part of the book is entitled, the last section is called Us. So my last question then is, is explain that choice. What does that mean? What does the us suggest? And what is, what is the conclusion you're hoping for us, the reader, to draw from that? So the book is sort of organized in, in a very simple way. Um, it's, it's actually chronological. Um, and so the first part is about him, is about Anthony. The second part is about her, um, about Ona. And then the last part is about us, about us as a family. 
um, and the sort of the inheritance and how and how what happened when when everybody came back together. And it's and curiously, um, some of what is closest to me in time remains the most elusive to me. Um, there, you know, my grandparents' marriage is still a huge mystery to me, like how they came together. I got a little bit out of my family, but not much um, about their life together. So really that's about, that's about, you know, it's, it's about thinking about my father who is kind of this constant, my father died when I was 18. Um, and so he's been this kind of puzzling absence in my life for a really long time as well. So it's really about like who we became and it's this question of like, well, what happens, you know, over these generations um, and what are the echoes and what, how do these, how do these things manifest themselves um, over time? So I guess that's really the us. The us is really us. Like it's just, you know, it's my family. It's how did we, how did we come out of this? And, you know, some of the answers are not great and some of them are sort of surprising actually. It's, it's really beautifully written, I have to say. And I, I'm also a fan, as you said earlier, of how short, a uh, good short book is not something you often discover in our field or in Russian literature um, in general. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Yulia. I, I, at this point, I want to turn things over to my colleague, Neringa Klumbite, Associate Professor of Anthropology, who I think is going to ask a couple questions, I hope. And then there'll still be some time for a couple questions from anyone in the audience should they want to ask them. And if, that, if you do want to ask a question, it might be good to send a, um, a, a note via the, the note function here in Zoom, but, but the I'll chat, mute myself, yeah. uh, the chat function, yes. Yeah. So I'll mute myself and Naringa, I'll, I'll let you. All right, hello everybody. And uh, my son always does something that I show up as, as Caius rather than <laughs> with my, my real name. So we are, with this online teaching, we are always part of the broader community of, of families and sounds and phones and other things. Yes, exactly. Thank you really so much for meeting with us and, and students and many more will look at the recording and um, uh, they are reading or they have read already the book, but they cannot join at this specific time. So I'm, I'm excited to see that uh, Ivan, James, Ashley, Alex are here, and Matthew, who just came from Lithuania, well, not just really, but came from, from Lithuania recently. And um, they, they really got a great chance to, to meet with you. I, had, I would like to turn also this to students um, in a few minutes, but I have, a few, uh, a few point. I would like to, uh, to make a few points and also to ask one question that I didn't, didn't. It didn't occur to me in the beginning, but as as you talked, um, you know, I would like to raise that point um, now. So one thing uh, that I kind of speaking to a broader audience, I was just so amazed, you know, how many parallels we have in our lives. Like my grandfather was deported on the same day. <laughs> from Konas for the same 17 years, you know, to Siberia. Wow. So they might have been on the same transport. Uh, may well, they sh well, maybe, yeah, because he was deported uh, with his mother and other women, not with uh, his father was separated at that time. Yes. Um, and there should be, what I wanted to mention, there should be archives about those de deportees as well. So I never got to that point to look at, at his archives because he was here to tell the story. but. Uh, there should be about Anna too, whether she was, you know, scheduled to be sent on her own or with her family. Usually they send with families and I, I believe that it's because of your grandfather as, as you say. Um, the, other, um, the other thing about, uh, about deportations, it's um, it just so, uh, you know, so fascinating to to read your narrative and in a sense to see a very different way of approaching this history uh, rather than it is being approached in Lithuania proper right so um, in that sense uh, for you go way beyond those narratives of suffering that are very much popular in Lithuania and when when I did my own research, you know, people were telling me, well, I have really nothing to tell you, you know, because my life in Siberia was good. Um, you should go and ask somebody else, you know, they 
had all kinds of different experiences, meaning, you know, that they don't have a story of suffering. So um, you go beyond that. And uh, of course, you include your grandfather, who is on the opposite kind of side of history. So I, you know, this occurred to me as you as you talked, how, how did they receive your book in Lithuania? So it's interesting. Um, I haven't, it, it hasn't had much exposure in Lithuania yet, um, okay. because it hasn't been translated. So the book is, uh, with the pandemic, who knows? Um, I did present the book in Kaunas at, um, at Bidotas Magnus University uh -huh. in November. And that was my first kind of um, foray into Lithuania. Um, I have to say, before I tell this story, I just also have to say that one of the major um, one thing that was really difficult about this book was my own uh, fear of of what of its reception. Mm -hmm. So I first had to I first had a lot of fear to overcome um, in terms of my family's reaction, um, and that was really like that required an, a sort of heroic amount of work. Like it was Herculean, it was crazy, um, and it was terrifying. Um, that went okay. And then I had to sort of, and then I had to worry about, well, what will the uh, North American Lithuanian community say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, wait a minute, are they, going to, are they going to disown me, right? So outing a Lithuanian as a Holocaust collaborator is not really generally a cool thing to do in our community. Um, so that was really worrisome. Um, and then I was invited and that sort of, you know, Lithuanians are kind of like, they're kind of involved with their own lives here. So they don't, they don't really pay attention and sort of the, and then it got a very good reception um, among Baltic scholars. So that was cool. So I sort of felt like I survived that level of exposure. Um, and then I was invited to present the book in Kaunas. And that was sort of really scary for me. Um, uh, and I prepared and I went and I was sort of like bracing myself for, you know, the things to be thrown from the audience at me. Um, and it didn't happen. I mean, it was, um, I got an incredibly warm reception, um, especially from, from the, the young people in the audience. So the audience was about half or more um, graduate students and um, young scholars, you know, early career researchers, and some of them were international, like Lithuanians who are teaching in Amsterdam or whatever. Um, and I have to say that, that, that it was really gratifying. I think that Lithuanians do find my work curious in terms of its form, right? So the kind of the, the essayistic style that I use and this form of creative nonfiction, which is a very sort of clunky term that North American creative writing programs have come up with for what we do, right? Telling true stories, but we're not, I'm, I don't tell stories as a historian. My, 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 my work is deeply subjective and that's something I'm actually really attached to and I don't feel the need to apologize for. Mm. And I think in Lithuania, this is still, um, this is still a really curious approach to telling stories about the past. So I, I actually have been the, the very small amount that I've, mm -hmm. I've had um, in terms of contact about this book has been pretty positive so far. So nice. we'll see. Yes, and it's also, I think it's a very convenient venue. It's, it's just your story, it's subjective and it doesn't tell anything really bad about Lithuania. Yeah, there was just one, one grandfather, not that there were some kind of generalizing narrative, so. Exactly, no, and that's something I feel really strongly about in my work. Um, I, I never talk, I never write about right. the Jews or yeah. the yeah. Lithuanians or the Poles. It's just not how I think. And I refuse to be pulled into those kinds of um, discussions. I, I will leave those kinds of discussions for historians. I'm not, I'm not a historian and I don't claim to be. So, yeah. And I think you provide, you know, an example how we could speak about our family histories with that in a relatively safe way, you know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, my other question um, goes back to what you said in the very beginning, and that was so interesting. You mentioned that writing the story was liberating um, from the history, in a sense, and it kind of goes... Uh, 
into the opposite side what everybody else are saying you know my assumption was that writing the story is just getting that knowledge that is going to be a burden that was going to be heavy for everybody and now when you say you know i was anxious how the family will receive it how others will receive it um and as in that sense, you know, sometimes silence might be even better. And there are all kinds of, you know, solutions proposed in those post-genocide um, studies. And uh, Rothberg uh, just recently published that book, um, Implicated Subject, calling all of us, like those who are white, you know, implicated into racism structurally. And, you know, Lithuanians, uh, it's just like, like in my family, I also know bits and pieces uh, of their connection to a, the Holocaust. But it just, it's just because I'm that from the region, I am an implicated subject by definition. So I cannot avoid that. And in a sense, for me, it is also a more a recognition of moral responsibility. So I wonder, you know, about your liberation. Do you really feel liberated or after writing the story, personally, maybe, you know, kind of it's getting all things, you know, laid out on the paper. But yeah, I would like if you could just speak more about that. So I might say, I don't know, liberate, liberated might be the wrong word. Um, I do feel that, so, so I won't lie, like this was the one, this was the hardest thing I've ever done, mm -hmm. uh, other than, you know, give birth. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it really was. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and it was the scary. One of the scariest things I've ever done was to put this book in print. I mean, I was, I was like nauseous um, with worry and, and fear when the book came out. Um, that said, I also, I do think that, um, the book has has given back to me in ways that have been really unanticipated. Um, the book brought my cousin and me really close together. Right, we are we have a much closer relationship now than we ever did. I mean, we were very close as children, but this is it's not even comparable to how I feel about about daughters now. Um, I also think that that you know that there's a process, and 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 for me, I had to go through the whole thing before I started to feel, and there were like stages of lightness. There were stages of lightness that I felt. Um, there was, you know, the, the, the absolute, the crushing discovery of, of Anthony's actions and his, his complicity. And then the, you know, the sitting with the ghosts, right? And the, the fear, like the, the other thing that I did that was incredibly, incredibly scary for me was when I went to see, go see Isaac Glick and I, and I sat with him for four hours over lunch. And I was so afraid to tell him who I was, that I was Anthony's granddaughter because I thought he would blame me. And then, and then learning and witnessing his grace and witnessing his um, generosity. And that, that was a moment of lightning. Right. And then um, when, you know, and then just working with editors and working with and sort of at every stage with the book, you know, instead of the book being thrown back at me, it was it was received. And with every person who received this book, there was a kind of lightning and sort of the the ultimate was when my aunt called me and I wrote about this on my blog recently. Um, and she said, you know, I love the book. And I was like, really? Because, like, did you read the part where I compared to <laughs> Eichmann? <laughs> or did you skip it? <laughs> you know, and then, so we had two conversations, my aunt and I, who has since died, actually. She's died since that conversation. Um, and she was in her 90s. And the, the, the process of the writing of the book, I think, also brought us together in ways that I think would have been impossible otherwise. Because there was so much distance and there was so much pain and there was so much difficulty. And I think my simply like putting it on the table and going, well, okay, so here it is here. Like, let's like, here it is. You can look at it. And I said to her, like, you don't have to agree with me. Um, and I've been very clear with my family about this is my take on things. You don't, you don't even have to read it. Like I'm not forcing this on anybody. Um, but that kind of, you know, every, each time that somebody said here, I'll take it, I'll take it. Like, you know, you hold it out and they take it. And so that, 
so what is it? It's, it's a lightning. It's a kind of like, there's a lifting, there's a kind of um, coming to terms. And I still, I still, you know, I still carry these things and I still, you know, the ghosts are still with me and, you know, the sadness and the loss, you know, that all, all the, that scar tissue is still there. But um, the experience of like, of grace, of people and of generosity and sort of the, the, the ways in which people reach back to me. Again and again, like in Siberia, in Lithuania, in, in you know, in, across generations, um, that it's, it's kind of worth it. Yeah. It's a great story. I read it and I wanted to call you right away just to chat about anything. <laughs> you know, it's okay, so powerful. I'm happy to get to do this Especially after on us, on us part, there is so much kind of love and uh, I don't know, all kind of things packed into that story. Anthony, you are more reserved. Um, yeah. but There's a lot of anger actually in that. Um, my husband read, my husband, who's a great writer and editor, um, read the first 10 pages and he went, geez, that's an angry start to a book. <laughs> think about it as angry, but. Yeah, but I, and I think, you know, and I sort of said to him, I said, well, yeah, but there's stuff to be angry about, you know, and it's this kind of, like he called it blistering. Right, um, but it feels like as if it's written by different people, you know, sometimes yeah. the voice is so different. So let's open it to students and others who have questions. So you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask. I can also, we can also look in the chat. We can look in the chat. We'd like to hear from you. Shall I read Matthew's um, comment? I don't see it. It's probably just for you. Oh, it's so, to yes. me. Well, do I, have, do I have his, Matthew, will you tell me if I, if I have your permission to read it? Absolutely, feel free. Okay. All right, because I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot. So it says Lava Saritas, which is good morning. My name is Matthew Stamolinis, and I'm a senior here at Miami U. My grandparents and great grandparents fled Lithuania, but never spoke about their experience with defection, even with their children. All I know is they took a rowboat to Sweden, then eventually made their way to the UK, Canada, Chicago, and then to Cleveland. I really appreciate the book, and I feel as if it helped me connect to my own family experience. In terms of a question, I was wondering, how did you make those connections with your grandmother's acquaintances? Ah, did you just drop into the village and start knocking on doors or use old addresses on postcards? Did you use a translator in Siberia? Um, uh, or were they able to speak Lithuanian? You'd mentioned that your Russian language exposure is limited. Additionally, as someone who works, who's working on specialization in religion, was there a strong religious practice in Brovka? You had spoken about a degree of hostility to the newcomer priest. Gotcha. Okay. So a lot of questions here. There are good stories to tell here. I'm going to try not to take up all our time. What time are we ending? Are we stopping at 11? Yes, 11 your time, noon our time, yes. Okay, my, yeah, 11 my time. So um, how did I find them? Um, so the first thing I did is I had to figure out where in Siberia she was, which is, is less obvious than you would think. So I had... Um, I had the letters and I had this place called Brovka and I think I sort of had figured out that it was in the Tomsk region. Um, and a colleague of mine, um, Elena, who is from Moscow, um, eventually found it on a map for me. You know, sort of native speakers have skills even with Google that um, non-native speakers don't. So she found a trace of Brovka and I had a nearby, I knew that Krivoshena was something that was mentioned in, in her interview. Um, so I had, so once I had the, the village, right, then, um, then I wrote to, um, then I figured like what I needed to do was get to Tomsk and then head to the village, which is about two hours by car from Tomsk. Um, and Tomsk is a major city, like Tomsk is a real place. So I wrote to, I sent, I, I Googled, I found the Museum of Oppression in Tomsk, which is like a museum about KGB and, um, Stalinism, oppression, and you know, it's, it's like in Vilnius, it has like the, the, the cells in the basement and all of that stuff and the Stalinist posters of the, you know, shh, kind of don't talk posters, remain silent posters. Anyway, so I wrote to, um, uh, and this is where it's sort of, I have a, this kind of series of miracles that happened when I was doing the research and my email went to some unattended email box, um, this guy called Vasily. 
and he said he never he never checked that email box um but one day for some reason he opened it and there was my email this woman from canada um to asking about brovka and weirdly like vasily turns out to be a brovka native like from well he was from um from Bilostok, right so across the river so there was brovka and Bilostok. um and he said like it was it was so crazy because he's the unofficial historian like he's written books about Brovka. <laughs> he's written books about Bilostok. like it was the weirdest connection and he's running this museum in tomsk um so that so, so then he was like yeah like i know Brovka. i can take you there and that's how he was really my scout um and he was the one who set up the various meetings with the different people and said so and so lived in your grandmother's house so he had access to all of that oral history and all of that memory um and was able also to sort of like you know like you know what what Russians are like, like they just sort of like they march up to people's doors and they're like, hello, we're here to talk to you. And you know, they don't take no for an answer and you sort of bar barge into people's homes. So we did a lot of that sort of barging into these um, old ladies' homes and talking to them and it was fantastic. The other person who I really called my, my guardian angel, um, her name was Svetlana Yarombevichute and she was the head of the Tomsk Lithuanian community. She introduced me to people in Tomsk who were Lithuanian deportees from, as children. With them, we spoke um, mostly Lithuanian. My cousin from Kaunas, he actually doesn't appear in the book because I don't know, I just, he just didn't sort of fit in the narrative, but he was with us and he um, acted as translator when I needed it. Weirdly, I found the very, very old women of, of Brovka much easier to understand um, than I found like Vasily was impossible. Like Vasily would just talk to me, you know, full speed ahead in Russian and I'd be like, oh my God. Um, and I was often sort of wandering in fields alone with, with Vasily. Um, so that was the linguistic, that was how we did it. Um, and yeah, so Brovka, one of the other things about Brovka is of course it's Brovka and Bielostok, it's, it has a very uh, longstanding Catholic tradition. So it is a really important place for Catholicism in Siberia. Um, and, and so for Vasily, that was a really important thing. He kept sort of trying to impress on me was this importance of Catholicism there. And that was something that people talked about a lot was my grandmother's spirituality um, and her faith. And that's that, that, that she used to talk a lot about how, how, um, how, how, you, how faith would, would allow them to survive and make it through. So yeah, so that's how we did it. It was, uh, it was a lot of luck and, and this is what like, and just, I think the other thing that I learned, that I've learned in my travels around the world doing this kind of work is you never turn down an invitation and you never say no. Like you, if someone offers to make you tea, you say, yes, please. Um, you ask lots of questions. Uh, you, you, I, I also have just, I have also learned that it helps to give people permission to tell you painful things. People want to protect you. So if you come asking about, you know, the mass killing down the road that your grandfather may have been involved in, they don't want to tell you because they're, they're like, geez, that's not going to be easy to hear. Like they're very, people tend to be very empathetic. Um, and I have just, I have a, a, a technique where I say, you don't have to worry about hurting me. I'm here because I want to know. And that's really helped. What a story. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Does anybody else want to jump in before you run out of time? I think you had some questions too that you had sent me, Stephen. Yeah, they were from Alex. I don't know if he wants to pose them, but... Uh... Alex, go on. Uh, okay, so... I guess the question that I think is most relevant based on what you've said is uh, you talked about creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, your writing with Ona on the cattle cart was actually pretty like in depth, I felt. I felt it had a lot of specific information. And I was wondering how much of that was on the interview versus things that you sort of compiled from what it was like to be on that sort of trip. That's a really good question. That 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 was part, some of what was so was was so difficult about this book was um, trying to sort of find the balance between like really creating novelistic kind of scenes um, 
but also being faithful to reality and to being faithful to my sources. So a, a lot of it was from the interview. I mean, the interview is where I got almost all the details about her, um, you know, about who she was with and, and about the women, the woman with the baby beside her and the stopping and the food. And so all of that is pretty, is very close to what she talked about. What they're, what they're, you know, what, what then I add, um, and I often do this with, um, with my work in general, is I ask, you know, there are things that I don't know about her life. So I extrapolate. So you'll sometimes read where I sort of say, you know, every de deportation memoir that I've read talks about this hole in the middle of the car and some that women sometimes put up um, curtains and people would relieve themselves, you know, in this, in this, um, in the hole through the bottom of the cattle car. Um, and the, and the, the, the stories of people being of, 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 um, of bodies being thrown out of the cars. My grandmother did not talk about that. I know that that's part of the story and I can include those details, but I, I do it in a way that I attribute the source sort of obliquely. Like I said, she, you know, she didn't necessarily talk about this. Sometimes I talk, I, I speculate as to why, um, why it's not in her narrative, but it's in other narratives. The other piece that I, that I, um, that I uh, did this kind of um, extrapolation kind of, work was uh, when I was when I was learning about how women survived on the tundra right so how did it, how did people eat from from wild plants and and what were the problems right so there were these these this thing called they call lebeda that they would that somebody cooked up and ended up poisoning themselves and you know the German women the Volga German women who had this deep deep knowledge of um of sort of folk food from tree barks and grasses and that kind of thing. So I did a lot of reading and work around women's lives in Siberia, reading everything I possibly could, because um, it's a very, it's a hard topic to sort of get your, get your hands around. Um, and then I would sort of try to sort of find connections to, there would be a clue in Olna's, in Olna's story, and I would try to sort of find something, something more that I could flesh, that would help me flesh that out. Yeah. Good questions, Matthew and Alex. Um, so I, as, as Naring alluded to, when, when I read the book um, earlier this year, I knew I wanted to talk to you about it. And I talked to Naringa to try and get you here. Um, we'd scheduled a Skype event that had to be canceled when the pandemic hit. We were, we were hoping to bring you physically this fall. Of course, that's not gonna happen. Um, but we're so grateful that you're able to join us this way and that the technology worked, you know, yay, yeah. to, the, yay to the Zoom gods. Um, it is such a fantastic book. Uh, I'll hold it up one more time, Siberian Exile. Um, thank you, Yulia, for joining us. It was really interesting. I think we learned a lot. We're so happy you didn't let these silences continue and that you've told you these stories that, that should be told. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think one of, the, one of the great pleasures for me is to see the different kinds of people who, who respond to this book and, and to my work in general. I tell stories about very small people in small places, small little lives. Um, and I'm always gratified when it's, um, you know, it's not just Lithuanians in church basements who are interested in them, that there's a much broader audience um, and people connect to these stories in surprising ways. So I, I appreciate the, the readership and the support and the interest and the invitation. Thank you to you and to Neringa for having me. I really, I really enjoyed it. And I apologize for the, for the, uh, you know, the, 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 the comedy of the telephone ringing. You know. <laughs> it's not, thank you, Yulia, so much. This yeah. was really And amazing. thanks for everybody who joined us, yep. Thank you. Thanks, have a great day. Yep, you too.